Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thrilled to see you. Uh, this is me. Um, I've worked for a lot of big brands, but for about the last 20 years, uh, and this is how I know Jackie, I've been doing a lot of work for small businesses. So what we're going to talk about today, um, there's a lot of stuff in here. It's two hours. We'll spend the last half hour with Q&A. Um, not all of it will apply to every one of your businesses, but I guarantee you all of you will walk out of here with something. And um, yeah, so we'll we'll go straight through because uh, I think taking a break in the middle would be awkward. But if you do have questions, put them in chat or you can save them to the last half hour and I'll stick around uh, as long as I can after that. Um, but, you know, if you need something else, we can always talk about that. Sound good? All right. So I'm sure most of you think marketing is a problem and it's tough, it's tough for you. That's what usually happens to a lot of people. And it's not that you're defective or you're not smart. It's that marketing is really hard. Marketing has an ever-changing landscape because the customers are changing, your competitors are changing, technologies are changing, social media is changing. All of this stuff is changing and that's what is going on. And there's no rule book for marketing. Like if you're an accountant, you know, you have the Federal Accounting Standards Board that gives you everything you need to know about accounting that year. It changes every year. And for the most part, that gives you a playbook from which to use. Marketing doesn't have that. The closest thing we have is called the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing from Rees and Trout. Uh, it's a, an amazing document. It's an amazing book. And it talks about all the things that kind of happen in marketing. And the best part about it is, and you can Google this. I see Laura trying to uh, squint to see everything. Um, you can Google it or, um, you know, it'll be in the deck when Jackie shares it. But you can break half of these, three quarters of these rules and still be successful. You can follow all of them and not be that successful. And so that's what we have to understand is that marketing is constantly changing. And one of the biggest things that has to go into it is the psychology of the buyer. So I have a couple of degrees and I teach marketing at the University of Texas, which you saw. Um, and nobody talked to me about the psychology of marketing until I was like 10, 15 years into my career. And then once I learned it, I'm like, holy crap, that's the secret to marketing. Understanding your best customers is the secret to marketing and understanding that your best customers are wonderful, amazing people who are completely illogical and say the dumbest things and will lie to your face. That's the secret to marketing. And so that's what you have to understand. And this class and all my classes that I teach are based on what's called the digital 15. These are the 15 core principles of doing digital marketing. Uh, you can, if you uh, want to see it bigger, because Laura's always squinting at the screen, um, you can go to the digital15.com and you can see the full list and blow it up. And there's some other resources there as well. But that's what we're going to talk about today is the psychology of marketing. And here's some things that ought to blow your mind. And I could have put together a list of hundreds, if not thousands of these things that always seem to change how people perceive things. There's a whole bunch of stuff that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But when you use these and you experiment and you try them with your brands, your products, your services, your customers, you will find that a lot of things can have a really good impact on your business, but a lot of them are completely nonsensical. And the reason for that is, is that you are actually only in control of about 5% of what you do. Think about it. You know, if you were walking even in your house or down the street, you're not thinking right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. You're a very, very complicated beast. And so 95% of your buying decisions happen in your subconscious before you even realize it. I'm going to take you through a whole bunch of case studies, a whole bunch of examples that are all research proven that really have changed brands trajectory because of the way they engage their customers on a psychological basis, not just on a logical basis. And one of the first things you need to understand, and I would write this down, this is a really good thing to remember about marketing, is that customers buy with emotion, but they justify with logic. Okay. It's one of the digital 15, but the reason and the premise for that is that you can ask your best friend, hey, why did you buy that product? And he or she will lie to you every single time. I had a friend who bought a Corvette. I said, hey, Scott, why did you buy that car? He says, oh, got a great deal on it. Handles like a dream. Um, really fun to drive. Scott is 55 years old. Does anybody believe that is why Scott bought a Corvette? 
Hell no. Emily, what do you think? Why did he buy a Corvette? Because he's a 55-year-old man and it's a status symbol. <laughs> yes, he's having a midlife crisis. He just got divorced. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden- If he was really oh, into a car that handled well, he would have gone European. Just saying. <laughs> probably. You're absolutely right. And that's the thing. He looked me, this is a man who's been my friend for almost 45 years. He looked me square in the eyes and lied to me. And that's what customers do. They justify with logic, but they buy with emotion. And then when I asked him, hey, Scott, you know, walk me through how you bought this car, because I'm looking to buy a car. And I said, what are the things you look for? And he said, well, you know, I just got divorced and I'm looking to get out back in the market. He was looking to up his own curb appeal with a car that has a little bit more curb appeal. And that's what you have to understand. So if you have been surveying your customers and not getting anywhere, one of the biggest reasons for that is that your customers justify with logic and what they give you is kind of worthless. Surveys are great for you want red or blue, things like that, but it's not really good to figure out how they think and how they actually purchase. Make sense? Okay, so let's do a little fun game here just to see how you think. I'm gonna yell out a question and I want you all, you can all take yourself off mute right now if you would, please. I'm gonna yell out a question and when I yell out the question, I want you to yell out the answer. Are you ready? Yes. 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 Jacqueline yes. was the only one who, that was a test before the test. Let's try that again. Are you ready? Yes. 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 That's still pretty <laughs> pathetic, but I'm gonna accept it. All right. What color is a yield sign? Yellow. Red. Yellow. Red and white. Yellow. Red. 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 Red and white. Red and white. <laughs> so this is the way your brain works. And by the way, under full disclosure, if you ever take a class with me, you'll see these two slides again because these are my two favorite slides in the world. <laughs> this is the way your brain works. Okay. So first of all, all of you who yelled out red basically said, oh, for everything that's right at 1140 something in the morning, shut this clown up, just yell out red, uh, or uh, just yell out yellow, sorry, just yell out yellow, because I actually stressed the word yield and yield and yellow, both start with Y and yellow means yield. So I actually tricked most of you into saying it. The people who said red came after the people who said yellow, because you actually pictured the sign in your head before you answered it. So this is the way your brain works, and this is the way your customers' brains work. Your brain is a dynamic mosaic machine that recognizes patterns. That's what it does. And there's too much information in the world for you to digest all of it, so you're looking for patterns and you're pulling up mosaics of what you've learned in the past. And that's the way customers buy and choose things. They do it in this very psychological pattern recognition system. And we're gonna talk about this. I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of examples. And so what we have to do is we have to test a bunch of things because I don't know your customers, but damn it, you should. You should know them like your brother or sister. You should be having conversations, again, not surveys, and saying, and using a magic phrase called, help me understand. If you say to anybody, help me understand, that puts them in the expert chair and they will go out of their way to tell you what's in their head and get it into yours. Now you can't overuse it and you can't use it like it was probably used to you in grade school when somebody said, hey, Aaron, help me understand why you think this is a good idea. That's calling you a dumbass to your face without calling you a dumbass. But we wanna do it in that authentic, incredible way and say, hey, help me understand. When you have a choice between all of these other similar options, why did you choose us? How did you even find out about us? What was the most important thing that you saw that made you click and call us? Those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. And there's actually a whole bunch of bias that goes into almost everything we do. Here's a very, very complicated chart, and it doesn't even have all of the 2,000 different biases that our customers and each, other, each of us go through. So what we have to do is figure out a way to hack human psychology of our customers. And that is by talking to them, getting to know them, and then relentlessly experimenting. This is what you have to do. Let's, let's just stop being wrong. I'm sure many of you really, really think you're not creative. How many people, just put it in chat, plus if you think you're creative, minus if you're not.
as expected, a lot of minuses. Good, there's a couple of pluses in there. Um, some cheaters in there with plus and minus. So here's the deal. Everybody is born an artist. Everybody is born creative. And up until the age of 12, you actually test at a very high level according to the NASA creativity test. But then you get into middle school and, and high school, it basically beats it out of you. And so then you start leaning into logic because it's much easier to find information and just deal with the logical kind of stuff. But what we're going to talk about today is that we can actually do things that are different and change people's perceptions in a way that is completely psychological and doesn't have a lot to do with the, uh, the physical world around us. So there's a couple things you need to start with. First of all, the simple answer is rarely the best answer. We live in a very complicated world. There's so much information. There's so many things going on. People are so stressed right now that if you come up with a simple answer, it's probably not going to be good enough. And if it is good enough, everybody in your market is going to be doing it at the same time. So how are you going to stand out? And we always have to ask what comes next when we do these experiments, because we've got to think what is the best possible thing that can happen and what is the worst possible thing that can happen and play it through and then run a whole bunch of controlled tests and see if these things work or don't work. And the other thing we absolutely have to realize is that we live in this digital world and most of you should be doing some form of digital marketing, social, email, whatever it happens to me, but crap delivered at the speed of light is still crap. So just because it's digital just means you can push out stuff very quickly and do a lot of great experiments. But if you push out the wrong stuff, all you're doing is using the technology to convince the market that you're not right for them. Make sense? So one of the biggest things you have to understand is with digital, we've got to get the messaging right. We've got to get everything right because it's not just about being on the medium. It's about showing up in the right way to get people to say, hey, this brand is really good. This brand has piqued my interest. And most of the time, the bar is pretty low. All you have to do is put something in front of somebody that says, that's interesting. Tell me more. If you can get a customer to say that magic phrase, they will go to your website. They will call you. They will send you an email. They will click on your social. That's what we're trying to do. And that starts with thinking about things in a very different way and being digital and thinking about the context by which things are delivered. That is one of the biggest things in psychology is that most of us are really beholden to the context at which things are delivered. If I, and I'm going to show you a whole bunch of examples of this throughout it, but I can actually change how you think things. And Zoom is one of the things. I remember um, I had a client in Dallas and I said, hey, you know, it, I just can't get a flight. Could we do a Zoom meeting in 2018? He's like, what, am I not important enough to do a, a physical meeting? Today in 2023, everybody does Zoom meetings. My students at college don't even know what a phone number is. They think a seven, a 10 digit number is a Zoom number. So context changes everything, and this is how we perceive things. And this is one of my favorite examples. This is San Pellegrino, uh, which is a very nice sparkling water. And here's Spindrift. What is the one and only key difference between these two aside from where they come from? Anyone? That little foil lid thing. The little foil lid thing, exactly. And why is that so significant? It feels fancy and European and cool. That's it. That's it. I know people who will serve San Pellegrino at a, uh, a wedding because it feels fancy and European because of the little foil lid thing. Spindrift is a fine, fine sparkling it feels, water. feels but, hygienic too. Well, that's, that is why they do it. But I am sure that somewhere in the financial bowels of San Pellegrino, some financial person said, why in the hell are we spending an extra few cents to put a foil lid on it? That's costing us money. But the psychological reason for it trumps that by a thousand percent, because now not only is it hygienic, but that's not what you guys cued in on. It is fancy. It can be served at a very, very nice place where Spindrift is just another kind of sparkling water. It changes the context by which this water is evaluated. And we can do that through a lot of different things. I'm sure that you probably heard the term vegan leather. There is no such thing as vegan leather. It is plastic. 
It is just another word for plastic. That's all it is. But now you see a whole bunch of people are talking about doing sustainable leather, which is basically plastic. And they've convinced people that this is not only a good thing, but something you should pay extra for, even if it costs less than real leather. So we can actually change stuff. And these are the kind of psychological principles we're looking for. And this is what we're going to lean into because most of you probably think you are logical based on our poll. But if I was to ask you what words come to mind right now, you might say the environment. You might say money because there's a big green box in front of you. Well, putting a big green box in front of you just made you very, very environmentally conscious and very, very price sensitive. Because green, at least in the United States, is the color of money and associated with money. So just by putting green there, I have changed. Yes, and we too. Uh, good answer, by the way, Lizette. Um, but it has changed your perception. And they've actually done numerous studies where putting something on a green background makes people look for a cheaper price. Where putting it on other colors makes them less price sensitive. All of these things make a difference. Giving coffee to your customers can make a huge difference. Caffeine gets them to do different things, things different ways, actually gets them to spend more money. That's why you see a, a Starbucks in every Target. That's why Trader Joe's often gives free samples of coffee. And Mercedes-Benz actually ran a very, very controlled test over several years where they put in absolute high-end barista stations at their uh, key dealerships. And those dealerships saw a 12 to 15% increase in sales and the price of the car because people thought they owed the dealership for getting a $7 cup of coffee. These little things matter. And so you should be thinking about how we can put context and how we can change perception of our environment for our customers so they think about it. Also, when we're doing things digitally, we have to think about uh, where we put things. Here are two ads that I get in LinkedIn all the time. Marketing is not a one size fits all kind of thing. We shouldn't just spread it like peanut butter across the bread and try to give everybody a little taste. We should figure out who our best customers are, lean into them, talk to them, and find out how we can clone them and get more customers like them. We don't need a whole bunch of deadbeat customers. Matter of fact, most customers, uh, a one out of five customers costs the brand money where one out of five customers drive 80% of the revenue. So what we should be doing is identifying our best customers based on these psychological principles and talking to them and not just give ads like Full Sail University. I work at the University of Texas. I have advanced degrees. I am never, ever, ever going to go to Full Sail University. They don't have a football team. So why in the hell do I keep seeing this ad every single day in my feed? This is because somebody is doing unelegant, just throwing it across, and we don't want to do that. We want to get back to doing this kind of stuff, where we are setting the context and really getting to understand how people come to us in a different way. And again, I'll show you a whole bunch of things that do this. Would images of couple copy do the job? No, it's a, it's a good question, Laura. It's actually called a process, or it's a psychological principle called reciprocity. Uh, when you give somebody a $7 cup of coffee, uh, not a cheapy, just, you know, here's a um, cooler full of coffee that's been sitting there all day, but like a, a Starbucks level coffee, they feel beholden to you because it is a, a something they value. And so having a barista make a $7 equivalent cup of coffee that they get at Starbucks means that I feel like I owe you a little something. That's why it works. Just showing the coffee doesn't do it, but that's a good question. Uh, also, if you play French music, people, um, yes, I think you're going to get one from Jackie Jing. Um, uh, if you play French music, people buy French wine. It's a whole bunch of crazy things like this that we're going to talk about. But these are the four things I want you to think about in order to use this. First of all, we talked about the first one. We've got to understand their emotional commitment and how they buy at a psychological level. Pricing is the most significant thing that controls your profitability. And if you don't know how to price, and if you don't, if you want to learn how not to price, look at Tesla. Tesla changed their prices every couple of hours, it seems like. Twitter changes their prices every couple of hours. And now nobody knows what to value those things at. So we're going to talk a little about pricing and how to set the price psychologically. Uh, also, we want to keep 
get more social proof and have customers share their experience. That's one of the most important things because nobody wants to be the first person to buy. And we have to understand that people choose things in a very elegant way. There's this uh, theory, it's called jobs to be done, JTBD. And basically it says that people are just a little too advanced to buy things because they need or want something. People buy things because they have a job to do. They hire your brand, product, or service to do a job for them, which is an outcome. I don't need a quarter-inch drill. What I need is a quarter-inch hole to go through my wall. The drill happens to get me the quarter-inch hole, but I'm actually buying the hole. I don't care. If a rat could make a perfect hole, if I could do it with a, a nail, I would do it. But that's what I'm doing is the outcome. And all of you should figure out what is the outcome your best customers buy you for. It is something that's a lot more elegant than you give it credit for. It's not because they're hungry or because they wanted Mexican food. It's something more emotional than that. Make sense? All right. So first thing we have to learn is that logic kills magic. And in marketing, if we could deliver magic, we actually can do a lot of things and make our brand the brand in the market and a much more profitable brand in the market. And if I gave you these two options and all of you were VCs, most of you would probably choose company one, right? It's cheaper. It tastes better. It just makes sense. It's all logic. Brand number two is Red Bull. Red Bull is one of the most psychological brands on the planet. First of all, it tastes like crap. You know how I know this? Because the Swiss Beverage Institute has tested 100,000 beverages, and Red Bull is the worst tasting beverage they have ever tasted by a factor of 12. And the people at Red Bull are thrilled by this because Red Bull tastes like medicine because psychologically it sells epic. When they say Red Bull gives you wings, what they're saying is that Red Bull gives you the ability to do something epic, whatever your definition is. If Tim's definition of epic is staying up all night and working on a project, if Laura's definition of epic is being able to do something else, if my student's definition of epic is studying all night for finals or going out drinking, they give it to you. And in order to deliver that, they've got to give you something that tastes medicinal. If it tastes too good, your body doesn't perceive it as having value. That's why most of us don't think that, uh, you know, cake and all the good sweet stuff doesn't do anything for us. So we have to have something that's medicinal. Also, Red Bull comes in four packs because we can't give you a six pack. This stuff is too powerful. And all of this stuff plays out in a whole bunch of different ways. Anytime somebody's wearing a Red Bull branded product or car or anything else, they are more aggressive, they win more races, and they drive faster or do everything at a heightened thing, even if they've never drank a Red Bull in their life. That is the power of being a psychological brand. And Red Bull constantly reinforces it with its marketing of showing Epic and their best customers doing Epic across a whole range of things. Matter of fact, it's been argued that Red Bull doesn't sell energy drinks. Red Bull sells the vision of Epic and just ties their brand to it and happens to sell an energy drink. And if you go to any 7-Eleven or any convenience store, you will see one whole door filled with Red Bull. All the other energy drinks fight over the other half that's next to them. Even all the other energy drinks together can't take up a full section like Red Bull does because Red Bull has the unique ability to sell you that one thing, Epic, and everything they give you designed to support that. Make sense? And there are hundreds of other examples of these. AIM toothpaste, when it first came out in the United States, was the number one selling toothpaste because it had three colors in it. So everybody assumed that if all the white toothpaste was the same, which by the way, almost all toothpaste is the same, this thing had two extra stripes on it. So it must do two things more than the white stuff. It didn't, but psychologically you see that. And then that goes for a couple of years and nobody copies it. But then Flonase comes out and Flonase actually said, well, you know, there's six common causes of allergies that we cure. Well, there's eight or nine, depending on who you talk to. They don't even cover two of those kinds or three of those kinds. But because they said we cure six, everybody assumed six was the magic number. Make sense? So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to set the stage that people can actually choose our products based on a list that we've given them. And sometimes the list isn't even perfect in the case of a, uh, Flonase. 
So what we have to do is we have to kind of design a nudge and a nudge is what we're trying to do to change behavior. And this is one of those things that we wanna do with our customers is we want them to think about and analyze things in kind of our terms. And first of all, let me say this before we get too far. I am giving you tremendous power. You should only use this power for good, not evil. You can use this to trick somebody to buy your product or brand or service at least once. But if you do it and they realize they've been tricked, they're going to not buy it again. And they're going to tell like 22 friends that you're a bad, bad person and you run a bad company. So all of this stuff is not designed for trickery. It's designed for honest and thoughtful engagement with our best customers because again we're trying to hack their behavior and give them more of what they want and show them that we have more of what they want make sense the other thing that's really important is marketing is not about making people buy stuff it's about showing your value to people who already have a desire a need or a want for that product and saying with a complicated world out there choose me because of this so that's what a nudge is designed to do is it's designed to give you an easy, simple way to change behavior because it's in somebody else's best interest, not in your best interest. And I wanna play this video real quick because this is the perfect way to think of a nudge. That's what a nudge is. Dozens and dozens of signs were put up trying to convince people to use the stairs and nobody did it. And when I say nobody, I mean virtually nobody. All of a sudden they made something fun and interesting and everybody was using the stairs for the most part because it's more fun and interesting. So that's what we're trying to do is not try to change behavior with brute force. In social media, we call it the judo move. If any of you have ever been familiar with judo, um, it's not about stopping a big, fast moving, aggressive individual coming towards you dead and stopping them with force. It's about channeling their momentum and using it to your advantage. That's what we're trying to do. So let's find what people naturally want to do and then lean into that. Make sense? All right, got another question for you. Is $400,000 expensive for a Rolls Royce? You can just put it in chat. Rihanna, we need to talk. You have too much money. That was a very quick no. Well, first of all, as you guys are all putting this in chat, um, it's a crappy question. It's the wrong question to ask because there's no context around it. $400,000 depends on a whole bunch of other things. And this is what Rolls Royce figured out when they showed their car at car shows where cars cost between 15 and 125 grand for the most part. Everybody talked about, oh my God, did you see the $400,000 Rolls Royce? Then they stopped that and they start showing it private jet and yacht shows um, where a $400,000 Rolls Royce is like you or I buying a keychain at a, a souvenir store and all of a sudden sales go through the roof. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. One is they changed the context, which we already talked about, but two is they were more targeted because these are the people who buy $400,000 Rolls Royces. So now they're showing up at a place where this thing is absolutely 
like a, an add-on. Would you want to show up your private jet, Brianna, or your uh, yacht without a $400,000 Rolls Royce? Of course not. Showing up in a Toyota, you'd look like a chump. So this is what they did, and it changed the way they now go to market, and they're selling many, many more Rolls Royces by being more targeted and changing the context, which, of course, makes it more logical. Make sense? So it's illogical in some cases and logical in other ways. Here are two pricing ones. We'll talk a little bit about pricing now because pricing is very psychological. First of all, as we discovered with Rolls-Royce, there is no such thing as a price that matters. It is the context by which it is displayed. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Peloton. When Peloton first came out, pre-pandemic, they could not sell their bikes for about $1,200. Nobody wanted to buy it. The reason is that a good, decent mountain or road bike costs about $1,200 minimum. And if you're going to put a connected screen and all of this other stuff on there, $1,200 seemed way too cheap. They doubled the price, more than doubled it, to $2,699, and they sold out, again, pre-pandemic, because that is a much more logical price for what they were offering in comparison to a real bike store bike, not a Target bike store bike. So this is what we have to understand is that... Um, <laughs> Can you talk about how Peloton was able to find potential buyers to speak with? Well, they uh, they set it up. Uh, Brianna, are you asking about how they found buyers? Okay, so a couple things. One is that they were already cycling studios, so they know what people were paying. So they based the price of the bike, their bike, on how much they purchased it for, how much it cost to manufacture, and then added to it, which is the lowest, dumbest form of pricing. Instead, they looked at, they should have looked at, and what they did is they talked to people who were in these uh, cycling studios and they asked them how much they were paying and how much they would be willing to pay for a home experience. And then they just arbitrarily doubled it and they started selling out because it was much more uh, 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 applicable to a real road or mountain bike. Does that help? Okay, good. Uh, so there's another thing is that how we set the pricing within ourselves, this is actually called popcorn pricing, obviously for a reason, is that if we go to a movie theater and we see a $3 popcorn that's tiny, that seems wholly inadequate. And then we see something that's a little bit bigger, but it's $6 and boom, you know, it seems like it's kind of expensive what it is, but then there's the six fifty giant tub, probably $9 now or something like that. And they usually say it's all you can eat. Here's the secret. Popcorn is incredibly cheap to pop, incredibly cheap. It is about 50 cents per unit for all three of these. That's how much popcorn costs with the bucket. And the movie theater is actually changing their profit margin from $2.50 to $6 simply by giving you that middle price that anchors you, as one person said, Emily, to convince you to buy the 650 one. Now, none of us need the giant refillable tub of popcorn, but it feels like we're getting something over on them. And that's one of the most important thing. And this is the decoy effect, or we can give a certain price and cross it out. This actually happened to me by accident. My son needed to get some dental work done and the uh, we're sitting in the lobby waiting for the estimate. And the woman gave me a $2,000 estimate for this dental work. As you imagine, my stomach sank and I felt a little sick to my stomach. And I was like, what the hell, $2,000? And she goes, oh, no, 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 sorry. We actually doubled it because he only needs one tooth done, but that was for two teeth. So it's only going to be $1,000. Immediately, I was met with relief. And then I'm like, hold on a second. I teach this crap. That was my own brain doing exactly what I know it shouldn't do, even though I understand these principles and teach these things, is that they anchored the price at $2,000. When they cut it in half, I felt absolute relief, even though it was a complete thing. And I had so much temptation to tell them this is how they should give their pricing, but I don't like them that much, so I didn't tell them. Um, and we can do this on digital as well. This is how a lot of publications and subscriptions sell their stuff. It's $12 for digital, $19 for print, or you can get both for $19. It's not a misprint. It is because they want you to get both because that way they can count you as two different subscribers because you're getting two different versions. And so everybody thinks they're getting something away. Again, this is a nudge. You feel like you're cheating them 
but they are actually getting what they want. Make sense? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, also, context is location dependent. If you buy a soda on the checkout at HEB, it's 96 cents. But if you walk 27 yards, and I've measured it from the front uh, checkout to where the sodas are, you can actually get them for 39 cents. But because it is more convenient, just like 7-Eleven is always able to charge more for everything they sell, people always pay more for convenience. Or one of my favorite examples is Shake Shack. Shake Shack has some of the most expensive soda in the world. $3.59 for a 16 ounce cup, which is really hard to get a refill because they're always so busy. And none of you knew it was $3.59. You know why I know that? Because they have a very complicated menu and you get so uh, confused with all the different options, you just automatically add on the soda and you never figured out what the price is, even though it's right there. And this is what Apple has done with Apple Pay. Apple Pay is designed to make the most painful part of an Apple Store visit, the $1,000 liberation from your bank account, wallet, or credit card, and make it instantaneously and put it in the middle, which is called the peak end rule. Most people only remember two things of any kind of event, the peak of something and the end of something. At Best Buy, the end is where you are liberated from $1,000 of your own money and you're walking out buyer's remorse that's a big chunk of change oh my god was this the right thing to do all of these things come across your mind apple puts it in the middle and the last thing you remember is walking out with that gleaming white beautiful bag as if everybody was looking at you but you think they are and so they've changed the entire psychological process matter of fact everything about the apple brand is built on psychology every apple store has big huge glass windows so you can see all the people in that's social proof. They have all of these devices you can play with. That's reciprocity because you feel like you're getting something over on them. And then they use the peak end rule and everything about Apple is designed to do that, which is why most of you own an iPhone and the 20% or 15% of you who don't, that's just a different choice. But Apple commands the market and most of us just buy the iPhone at the Apple store because that's what we know what to do. It's all based on psychology. The other thing Apple has figured out, and this is an example from a ice cream store in Iowa that actually charges an insane amount for ice cream, but pricing equals quality. High price equals high quality. So anytime you're running discounts and sales, what you're doing is telling the market subtly that we have low quality. That's what we're trying to do. So sometimes overpricing and pricing things at this certain level can give people the sense of quality. Uh, matter of fact, there was a jewelry store in New York when I was there a few uh, years back that accidentally doubled the price of their turquoise jewelry instead of putting it at 50% off. They sold out of their turquoise jewelry because everybody thought it was such high quality at double the price when they couldn't get rid of it at half price. So you should absolutely experiment with your pricing and don't ask your customers because they don't know. You've got to set the context to convince them of the high price. You don't just put the price out there. That's what uh, Tesla and Twitter are having problems with now. They're not setting the context, right? They're just arbitrarily changing the prices. And when they do ask about Twitter in particular, uh, Elon Musk says, because we need money. None of you care that Twitter needs money. What you care is what you get for your money. One of the most important concepts of marketing is what's called WIFM. What's in it for me? We are all narcissistic bastards. We want what we want. And with them is what you need to remember. What is in it for me? That is what your job is. And that's what psychology can help you do. Make sense? All right. Couple more pricing. At least one more, two more. I remember when I was in college that there was a pizza place and chicken joint that used to throw away chicken wings by the barrel load every night because they couldn't sell them. Now, chicken wings, because they're dipped in sauce, even when they're not, are the most valuable part of the chicken. Why do you think that is? It's not that they have the most meat. It's not that they're the best. It's because chicken wings are celebratory foods that people get together and eat with friends at special times. The chicken wing has actually become something psychological where the breast and the drumstick are not. And so that's what we have to remember. 
is that sometimes if we can create the context right, we can actually get away with something, which is frankly highway robbery at this point in time. The other thing you need to remember, and this is some research I did for Amazon, is that there is no such thing as reality when it comes to pricing. Everything in pricing is psychological. And here you can see a whole bunch of things that are close or kind of like $50, but yet none of them equal $50 depending on the context. Matter of fact, nine out of 10 people would prefer a $50 Amazon gift card to $65 in cash. Yes, all of them could do math, but the reason is, is that if I gave you $65 in cash, and let's be clear, I'm not offering that, um, most of you would shove it in your wallet or you'd buy gas, groceries, or give it to your kids. The drudgeries of life, unfun, uninteresting stuff. But if I gave you a $50 Amazon gift card, the world is your oyster. What are you going to buy? Could you buy a present? Could you add it to something? There's so many choices. Endorphins are released, and you're actually more excited about $50 than you are about $65. Matter of fact, Amazon Cash is one of the most and uh, highly valued um, incentives to give out to people because they can use it for virtually anything. And so you can see there's a whole bunch of different ways. If we cross out the price, if we do $49.95 versus $40, all of these have been done time and time again, and they are like gold because they always work. Excuse me? Make sense? All right. The other thing is that we've got to think about the perception and how things work. Uber was not the first ride hailing app. It wasn't even the top 20 or 25 ride hailing apps. The beauty of Uber is that it told you that your black Prius was coming from around that corner and Tim was driving it and it'll be arriving in two minutes. It gave you an assurance of what it was. If you've ever been to New York where all the taxi cabs are all now yellow Priuses, it is virtually impossible to figure out which one is yours, even if there's 30 parked out there, or if there's one parked out there. That is an anxiety-ridden experience. They've taken the anxiety out of it, and now you can feel like a rock star in an episode of Entourage who gets out and goes into your very special car because you know it's yours, and everything makes you feel better about the transaction, which is why they're the number one ride-hailing app. It is not that they do anything typically better. It's that they have occupied that space, that they have an assurance that's going to make it seamless and easy for you. And there's always enough cars for you to get an Uber, even if you have to pay a little bit more. Make sense? So that's what we're trying to understand is that a lot of what happens with experience is a psychological thing. And Disney is about as great as this as anybody. Disney will time you how long it takes to get on a ride, but they give you enough different things to do that nobody actually thinks it's that uh, length of time. Time is not real. It's how people perceive time that's real. And I'll give you a prime example. If you're going on a really cool trip with your friends or your family, you are so, so anxious to get there that the drive or the flight there takes forever. But on the way back, it happens like that. That is because you're not anticipating all the stuff that's going to happen. So you've actually changed the entire process by which you instruct time because you're waiting for something super exciting. Uh, yeah, well, uh, well we, we won't talk about uh, Payless uh, in this because we'll get to it, something like that. Uh, also, a couple of other small things. Um, we did this work for Sam's Club, changing the word from buy now to shop now increased sales 42%. Because if I send you something on social or on an email, buy now makes you assume that the next screen you would click or see after that you click that would be a shopping cart where you'd add in your credit card. Well, let's say it was like a cooler. I might want to see some reviews. I might want to see if it comes in a different color. I might want to see, you know, if how much shipping is, all of these other things. So we can actually change things by just using different words. And again, we should be experimenting with these things and looking at best practices from bigger brands than us to see what version of their bu uh, buttons they're using. Best Buy used to require a guest checkout. Um, or, or used to require you to get a full account before you could check out. Now they've changed it to a guest and they saw 45% increase and $15 million in just the first month alone because you have a whole bunch of questions that need to be asked 
and answer it before you can buy. And if you don't have those, like how much is shipping? When is it going to be here? All of that stuff. You will just go someplace else. This is a concept called friction. Anytime we frustrate our customers, we call it friction. And when we give enough friction and there, enough is a very, very low bar, when customers are frustrated, they leave. And now they're not going to leave Apple. Apple can have an amount of friction because we love Apple and they do so much for us. But your smaller brands can have virtually no friction because anytime they can't find something, they will just leave. Matter of fact, your website should be one of the easiest things to use. And if people can't get what they want on your website within a couple of clicks, you're basically telling them that you don't know how to run a business. And the psychology of this is that if your website is not clean and updated and easy to use, they will assume you can't make a burger because you can't make a website. Now, I know the skill sets are totally different, but people don't think that, that way. Your website is actually an arbiter for how good you are at business. And if they see a cluttered, awful website, they won't want to use it. Make sense? All right. A couple others here. Uh, James Dyson is one of the most narcissistic men on the planet. And he created the Dyson vacuum cleaner because he invented this cyclonic action that sucks and swirls. And he wanted to show everybody his sucking and swirling action. 24 different manufacturers looked at it and said, you're an idiot. Who in the hell wants to see the dirt? We do. It is really, really satisfying to see the dirt. Even if you don't know it's that exact piece of dirt, but when you run over a piece of dirt on the carpet and you see it swirling or something that looks like it could be it in the thing, you have closure. You are whole as a person, at least for 15 minutes. In an enclosed container, you don't feel that way. That is the difference between this. And now it is almost impossible to find a non-clear bag or cylinder for a vacuum cleaner because it gives you so much closure. Yes, good point, Emily. Um, here's another one of my favorites. Uh, A&W actually came out with a three-ninth pound burger, which is math. How many people here like to do math? Anyone? Put your hand, hand down, Jessica. It was a trick question. Nobody likes to do math, uh, especially not customers. So originally, they had come out with a third-pound burger, but Americans can't figure out that a third pound is bigger than a quarter pound because a four is bigger than three. So then they doubled down and they called it three ninth pound burger. Anytime that you're asking people to do complicated kind of equations or thinking about stuff, they won't do it. This probably should have been called the bigger burger or the biggest burger or something like that. And that's what we have to understand is that people are very, very illogical in a lot of what they do and they're looking for patterns and a numbered pattern like a quarter versus a third pound is just too simple for them to ignore and resist and so we have to think about these things and we basically uh, buy brands based on how they make us feel not on what they actually say or deliver and i'll give you a couple of indications of this. So if you're shouting about prices, you're really doing marketing wrong. You should be convincing people all the stuff you offer, why they should buy the higher price. And the perfect example of this is Tide. I am willing to bet that 80 to 90% of the people on this webinar use Tide. Not because it's the best laundry detergent. It's not. Persil and Kirkland actually clean much better than Tide in independent tests. Um, but most of you use Tide because your mother used Tide and her mother used Tide and her mother's used Tide and her mother's mother's used Tide. And the reason they use Tide is because the first automatic washing machines came with a little sticker that said, your clothes will get cleaner if you use Tide. That's it. And so most people walk into the, and it's, it's, I see a couple of people who say that they don't, but bless your hearts, the statistic is 80%. Um, most people walk into a store and buy Tide because they know they can trust Tide. Their clothes have been clean. The smells get out of them. So they just buy it. Even though it's an $8 purchase, they don't want to risk having dirty clothes or smelly clothes. So it's just easier to buy Tide. And all Tide then has to do is remind you that they're still in business. And then they throw a couple of new versions of it. So they get you to buy one maybe before you didn't or something like that. But that's the way Tide works. It's all psychological. And that's how people choose things is they use people to decide. 
So one of the most important things is having so what we call social proof. Anytime that you can, you need to get a testimonial of some kind. A smiling person with your product will do it. A quote from somebody, a video is even better. A real human being saying, I've used this brand, product, or service, and I love it. And you can see some of the research that we've done here in terms of how people use it. This is how people choose things. If you're in a home environment where your products are used in the home, almost all of us go on the next door app or go next door and ask our friends, do they use it? Do they like it? Have they had a good experience with this brand, product, or service? Matter of fact, we hate our neighbors. We can't stand them. Don't worry, they hate us too. But the other day, they came over to ask and get the number of the guy who was painting our front house. Even though they hate us, they trust us to pick a good painter. That's how social proof works. And of course, the proof of all of it is none of you have bought a product on Amazon that's less than four stars. If you have, and you realized it was less than four stars, you called yourself every name in the book because you know better. And that's what we're looking for is proof that I'm going to make a good process of, of um, a good purchase here, whatever it happens to be. And so what we're trying to do is really become the brand in our best customers' uh, minds. So that way they tell other people about it. Make sense? Okay, now this next example doesn't convince you that almost everything is psychological. You can just hang up, leave Zoom, flip me off as you're walking out the door. All of that would be perfectly acceptable. All right. This is Diamond Shreddies. In Canada, they had this brand of cereal called Shreddies. And they asked a whole bunch of different advertising and marketing people to come up with something to change it into something that was worth buying again because people had stopped buying Shreddies. A 20 year old intern said, Why don't we call it New Diamond Shreddies? And in case you haven't figured it out, they took a square and rotated at 45 degrees, added the word new, which is a magical marketing word, diamond, which means high-end, valuable, you know, whatever, and market share, not sales, market share increased in 18% in the first month alone. If that doesn't blow your mind, that's incredible. The best part is that when they had shreddies and new diamond shreddies on the store shelves simultaneously, Shreddies went for $3 a box, Diamond Shreddies went for $4.50, and the Diamond Shreddies would always sell out before the regular Shreddies. And I know what you're saying. All right, Chris, this cannot be true. And if it is, it's probably a Canadian thing, which is a fair thing to say. But it is true. And here are some of the actual people who are interviewed, and none of these people are actors. For 68 years, Shreddy cereal remained the same. Wheat squares. And that's what Canadians thought of when they thought of Shreddy's personality. Squares. Until now, under the guidance of the world's leading scientists, we created a serial revolution, Diamond Shreddies. To promote this angular upgrade, we created a multimedia campaign that included a package redesign. Outdoor. I get it. Television. Oh. What strikes your mind when you look at it? It's it's more interesting looking. Yeah, it's yeah, just, uh, that's what I mean. There's been a lot of research going into it to sort of bring out the diamond in it and yeah. turn it into a diamond. It's funny some people don't even notice the difference. Print. Draw. Funny. A website. Yes. Oh. Witty. And viral videos. But it's kind of like thinking about uh, uh, a six or a nine, like a six. If you flip it over, it looks like a nine, but uh, it's, a yeah. six is very different from a nine. M and a W. And M and a W, exactly. It's a Actually, when you don't see it, like when I sat there, like it, you just look like you turn it on its end, but, but when you see it like that, it's, like, it's more interesting looking. Just try both of them. Take a uh, square one there first. Which one did you prefer, first of all? First one. The first one? It had more flavor. Okay. That's interesting because the, the first one was the diamond. The diamond one felt more crunchy. It's sort of out of a popping sort of 3D effect. Canadians reacted instantly to the campaign 
and the previously flat growth of Shredhees jumped to 18.6%. Within 24 hours of the launch, Canadians had taken to the web. I see this billboard, right? And it says, new, new, new. New Diamond Shreddies. New Shreddies Diamonds Cereal. New Diamond Shreddies. Those are diamond shaped Shreddies. Oh my god, like a diamond shreddy. Diamond Triscuits. They're worth the price. Simple marketing, really. I mean, anyone could think of it. They also said that Diamond Shreddies was the best marketing campaign in history. Jesus Christ. I laughed for like 10 minutes. I just went out and bought six boxes. Stupidest idea I ever seen. Now, when Canadians think of diamond shreddies, they think of 45 more degrees of delicious. Genius. Literally, literally genius. And the, and the intern got a job. He got a very good job. He got a ton of credit. He did fine. Um, but yeah, that's what we're talking about is how can we show up differently? And if you think about this in terms of something we all have and use our cell phones, um, Verizon used to say we have the best network and they don't anymore because their network is kind of on par with everybody else. T-Mobile, um, says they're the uncarry, which is totally different. They've created a whole new positioning for themselves and AT&T says fast, reliable, and secure. The problem with AT&T is that is literally the basis for the minimum amount of cell coverage you would accept from somebody. If I said slow, sketchy, and kind of wonky, you wouldn't buy AT&T at all. But fast, reliable, and secure is literally what I expect from a cell phone carrier in 2023. As a matter of fact, that's the base of what I expect. That's why they are having trouble gaining market share, Verizon as well, but T-Mobile, every single quarter is setting records for growth and subscribers because they are saying they're we're totally different than everybody else, even though they have their own problems, but they've created something that's new and unique and different in the market because they've understood that when we talk about things like this, we have to get through people in this stage thing, which is called the marketing funnel, where we have to get them to think about us differently, then educate them, and then finally get them to convert. So we start with smaller things up front. Hey, here's a little piece of information. Here's something that's going to help you do your job. Here's a bigger thing that's going to help you do your job. And then finally, oh, you have a problem? We can help you with that. That's what we're trying to do. Make sense? Questions on that? All right. So let's talk about how this looks when we actually put it into place in terms of different types of things. And here's a whole bunch of examples we're going to go through. So this is Grammarly, where they do this small, medium, and larger kind of version into it. So they break their things up to give people a little bit of what they want, give them something they can bite into, then snack and then a full meal, which is really, really important. So that's what we're trying to do. Not just give everybody one thing all at once or treat everybody the same and assume everybody needs the same thing. We want to give them what they need and be as prescriptive as humanly possible. Also, we want to speak to people the way their friends speak to them. That's what they're looking for because we're trying to have a relationship with them after all. So here is a dynamite one where it's talking about my fur baby is a dog or a cat because people who are really into as Jessica's kissing her puppy, uh, as people who are really into their animals, they talk about them in a very, very different kind of way. So talk to people the way they talk to their friends and their family members about it. And you'll get a lot better conversion because they'll feel like they're talking to a real person and not some kind of robot or some nameless, faceless company. Also, make sure they're very clear on how much they're going to save. This, again, is a nudge. We're showing people how they can basically get a better value by signing up and paying up front. So don't just show the prices. Give them the context. Hey, look, you will get more of this and we will get a bigger savings for it. It feels logical. It feels like the right thing to do. And most of us will take that bigger version and pay for it. But when we're giving choices, three is probably the optimal number because we have this paradox of choice. The more choices you give somebody, the more they will get locked up. Three is probably the best number in most cases, but you know, if you have more than three products, you might have to do this, but you don't want to give people too much choice 
Otherwise, they don't know what to do. Or if you need to give them a lot of choices, bucketize it so they can shrink what is seemingly 24 different choices into six different buckets. And then I'm choosing from one of the buckets and what's in that bucket. Very, very important. Otherwise, this again is psychological friction and people don't know what to do. And if people don't know what to do, they just don't choose. Um, but choice comes up on your web pages. Nobody needs 64 things at the top of a navigation bar. That is confusing. Matter of fact, most of the time, the stuff you have up there is stuff that is for you, not for what the customer is looking for, not for what they would expect. We probably want about three to six things at most, and we want them to be very clear in what they are. And on our web page and most things we do digital, we want one call to action. That's it. We don't want to give them multiple choices to do something. We want to convince them this is the right thing to do and tell them this is the easiest thing to do and then test that button, the, bu the words in that button to make sure you get it right and make sure it's really easy for them to understand what they're going to get. And you can see this next B1 is a very, very clean landing page, which if you're running any ads on social or on digital or on Google, anywhere, you should have a landing page. Because if that ad goes to your main website, you've actually dropped them in what's called a digital desert. You promised me 20% off. You promised me the answer to this question. And now I'm on the front page of your website that has none of this. I'm on, not only um, lost, but I'm pissed off and I'm frustrated, which means I will leave and probably never come back, which again, Bigger brands can uh, uh, survive that. Most smaller brands cannot because once you lose a customer, it's a 95% chance they will never come back ever in their life or your life. Um, also, remove all of the buttons and headers on the landing page. Make it clean and simple. So that way there's one place, one thing to go. And we talked about social proof a little while ago. It's really important that we have this everywhere on our website. But one of the most important things is social proof works in two ways. These are the old Sonic ads where these people were going into Sonic. They turned me off so much that I wouldn't go into a Sonic for fear I might see them there. The people you have on your website, the social proof you had should better look and feel like my best friends, the kind of people I want to hang around with. If you have too, versa, too diverse of a group, like you're trying to convince old and young, it's not going to work for both groups. We need to have people that look, smell, sound, taste, act, and feel like our friends and people we want to hang around with. And then we can put it together in a multitude of ways and then use it everywhere we can. Because again, social proof is one of those little pattern recognition systems we look for as a hack for what to buy. And it can take a lot of different forms, as you can see here, or we can just use brand names. We can talk about the brands that buy us if we're in a B2B world, or we can talk about the number of people that we've helped or serviced. McDonald's for years used to count the number of millions of people that bought at McDonald's. So now these are all forms of social proof and that make people feel comfortable that they are not gonna be the first ones in, but they are gonna be one of the people who is joining this wave of people who found magic in this brand. Make sense? All right. The other thing is when somebody has a problem, look at it as an option to give some amazing customer support. That's what people are looking for. That's what they want. They want to be helped and served anytime they want. You can be right and still lose 20 or 30 customers. So give amazing support. And if somebody has a bad experience, say, hey, Laura, I am so sorry you had a bad experience. This is atypical of what we typically hear from our surveys and from our customers. I would like to personally ask you to give us another chance. I want to prove to you that this is the kind of place that you and your family and friends should be coming to. Give me one more chance to not only make it right, but have you come back in and experience the kind of service that I know you're looking for. That's what we're doing. And if we do it right, what we get is a whole bunch of people being told this, and we don't have a whole bunch of people being told not to go here. I was looking for a tailor the other day, and immediately I looked on Google, and there were three tailors. One with two stars, one with 2.5, and one that was a lot further away with four and a half stars. Anybody want to guess how far I drove to go to the one with four and a half stars? It was three times as far because why would I go to a place that has two and a half stars? 
I'm just asking for trouble. I'm smarter than that. The other thing that we need to think about is that a lot of times people just need to see your brand. This is where trust and familiarity come in. It's called the mere exposure effect. Seeing your brand on social, seeing you in an email. By the way, email is the most effective form of digital marketing. For every dollar you invest in email marketing, you generally get $40 back. And email addresses are really, really important right now because Google has mandated that every business start using Google Analytics 4, which means that if you have an email address, you can actually get more information and use more data because Google will basically say, you know this person. And so if we use that and we push our stuff out to more places and they see it more often, they feel more comfortable because it feels like this thing has been around for a while. This is actually a weird form of social uh, proof. And then when we do things, we don't want to be different everywhere. We don't want to change our logo. We don't want to change our colors. We don't want to change our messages. We don't want to change our ads. We want the same ad basically delivered in different forms, but we want to say the same thing because if Tim sees something, three different things from the same company, his brain, as complicated and smart as it is, will automatically assume, is that three companies or one company? I don't know. I'll just go choose somebody who feels like one company. Uh, there are email ads. In my email, I feel like overwhelmed. Oh, yeah. So, Laura, the thing on email is this is in the digital 15. Email is a privilege, not a right. If I give you my real email address, not my Yahoo address, that means I want a relationship with you. And your job is to treat that like it's my front door. So only send me stuff that is truly valuable. Don't spam me with stuff. The reason you hate most email is about 70% of marketers just continually send you buy my product, buy my product. We have it on sale now. It's not tailored, it's not specific, it's not helping you live your life, it's helping them convince you to buy something and that's not what we wanna do, okay? Um, the worst question to ask when you're trying to do this, because I've told you you should be experimenting, is if we did this, would you like it? People can't handle that question, there's no stakes, they can just throw out an answer, there's no re uh, reason for them to like it or not like it, there's zero commitment, these are the things that we're trying to avoid. Again, we want to have a conversation, and this is the best part of my job, five to 10 minutes saying, hey, Jessica, um, how did you find out about us? With all the other brands that are like us, why did you choose us? What was so specific? Um, what do you really like about us? How are you using it? Just have conversations with, again, your best customers, not every customer, not the first time customer you know, over and over again, try to find the Jessica's of the world who bought from you five or six times where everybody else comes in once because that's called customer lifetime value. That's where businesses become highly profitable by having their most valuable customers bring other people like them along and keep buying from you at the same time. Make sense? So up front, I told you that basically we have these laws and rules of marketing and they work except when they don't. And Right now, I want to take you through probably one of the best case studies in modern history, which is Liquid Death. If you're not familiar with Liquid Death, it is a water brand, sparkling and still water. If you've ever tried it, it's pretty average at best. It doesn't even taste that great. It's about the same price, but Liquid Death is right now on target to be a billion dollar company in less than three years because almost everything that they learned from the Red Bulls of the world, they've taken and applied to water. And the genesis of this brand is amazing. First of all, uh, the guy who founded it, Mike Cesario, noticed that when he went to a heavy metal concert that all of the heavy metal acts were drinking monster energy drinks, but on the can was stamped tour water. And the reason for that is you can't drink two and a half hours on stage and drink energy drinks, your heart will explode. So they were giving them something that looked like Monster for branding purposes, but they actually wanted water because they needed the water for hydration while they're performing. And he thought to himself, well, what if we marketed something that was healthy, like water, the way we market stuff that's unhealthy, like candy and energy drinks, thus liquid death was born. It is the fourth name he came up with. He tried a bunch of different names and it's called liquid death because it means death to plastics. He's leaning into an environmental message. And this is the kind of marketing that he does. 
Should I go ahead and put the blindfold sure. on? By the way, if you have kids, there are swear words. In so, can you see? Nope. Okay, <laughs> perfect. What do you think? I like that. It's sweet. That one's pretty good. So between the two, would you? Yeah, that one might make me sh myself, for sure. Oh, okay. Do you need the bucket? I might really vomit. Oh Jesus! F you, dude. Putrid. This is bad. What's in it? <coughs> oh, man. That... Do not make me try it again. <coughs> oh. So between the two, which do you prefer, A or B? Yeah, I prefer this a lot. This is much better. It tastes way better. Yes, I love this one. A is the way to go. No more B, please. Hate it, B. Hate it. No, no, th that's B again. Oh, oh. Better than the most expensive beverages on Earth, starting at $1.99. Blindfold your friends. See what they prefer. Murder your thirst. So which do you prefer? That one, dickhead. Most of you would have been tempted to try your product against the bigger brand and say which one tastes better. But Mike's thought is, what is the dumbest thing we could do right now? Let's try that and see if it works. And by changing the context to something that's ridiculous and expensive, he made something that's far more interesting, far more fun, and far more compelling, but more importantly, far more shareable than if he would have tried it against Perrier or any of the other sparkling or non-sparkling waters. Make sense? Then he did it again when he started to see that a bunch of people were talking online about this being the worst tasting water on the planet. So this is what his next video was. Liquid death water took over the me as the worst water. Literally the worst water I have ever tasted. Like the differences are very, very subtle. So I guess the worst one, huh? Pick the worst water. Okay. I think it was, was it? No, the, one of these was really bad, but it was in. I think this is the liquid death. Liquid death isn't the worst water out here. It's not bad. I guess I was I was wrong. Not the worst water I've ever tasted. I'm sorry. I would buy y'all's product now. Liquid death. Officially not the worst water two guys from the internet have ever tasted. So there's a whole bunch of videos on liquid death, most of which I don't feel comfortable showing you because they are That's constantly awesome. trying to push it. I'm glad you like that. Um, they're constantly trying to push the envelope and what they will tell you in their pursuit of being a billion dollar company in just a few years is that there is a very fine line 
five degrees this way, way too weird, way too off target. Five degrees this way, way too lame, way too uninteresting. So they're constantly trying to figure out where that uh, fine point is. But you can see the growth has just been absolutely phenomenal. It's going to be over a billion dollars probably by the end of this year. And socially, before they even really launch the product, they have more fans and followers than almost every other brand on the planet, except for Red Bull and Monster. And so that's what we're looking for is a way to engage people in a much more interesting way because the logical answer was right in front of us, right? Let's shut down these haters. Let's um, test it against the other competitors and see if we can't find a difference. But this is more entertaining. It's more interesting. It's more fun. Now, again, not every brand can do this, but before you self-select um, and shut yourself down, Try out a couple of these ideas. Find a family friend or better yet, a customer and say, hey, listen, you bought a lot of products for me. If I made this kind of product uh, or actually make it, or if I put this ad in front of you, what would be your reaction? If I said this to you, what would be your reaction? That's what we're trying to do because we don't want just the logical answer. We want a magical answer. You know, the everywhere, everywhere you have a consumer interaction, whether it's in advertising or in customer service or experience, there's the opportunity for that kind of just astonishing magic. You know, in other words, you, if you get people, if A is better than B, okay, right? 99.9% .9 of people try and improve B. The creative person says, if we get people to look at A and focus on A, they won't notice B at all. So you don't have to improve it. That's what we're trying to do. If we can get noticed and get them to find affinity, they will live rent free in your, in your brand, will live rent free in their brain, and you will be able to sell them more stuff at a higher value than your competitors. But what you've been trying to do is convince them that you're better than your competitors and cheaper which are two things that most of us don't look for when we buy products, because again, cheapness means cheap stuff. So what we're trying to do is find these very illogical, but sometimes wondrous things, and it takes just experimenting. And don't start with a blank piece of paper. Go do your research. Go find a brand that's doing something amazing and figure out, they probably have a $100,000 or a million dollar marketing department. They've tried a bunch of this stuff. Go steal stuff from them. Go figure out what they're doing and then create your own version of awesome from that. And if you're uh, you know, sensitive, did he just tell us to basically rip off other people's marketing? Yes, I did. The same way every great master in any art has ripped off the people before them. Picasso learned from the people who came before him. Beethoven learned from the people that came before him. They took their strokes, they took their notes, they took their things and they changed it into something that was new and unique and novel because they added to it. So don't try to create stuff from scratch. You will not do it. I do this for a living and I don't try to create stuff from scratch. That's what we're gonna do. And then we're gonna go test this stuff and then really understand our best customers and then talk to the people who actually talk to your customers. If you actually have salespeople, they're interacting with customers all the time. If you have frontline service people, talk to them and then trust your gut run a controlled experiments, very small experiments. So if they fail, you learned a lesson. If they don't fail, you found a new way to create magic because we don't live in a world where we have wins and losses. We live in a world where there's wins and lessons. And the more you experiment, the more quantity you get, the more quality you get. And one of the easiest things to do is sometimes to work from the back. What do we want our best customers to do, feel, or see? How could we get there? Is there another brand, even if it's not even in a related industry? Could we learn something from a shipping giant like DHL to help sell lawn care products in Austin, Texas? If the answer is even close to being yes, or there's one thing you can learn, it's probably something you should be able to do. And that's what we're trying to do is create this magic. And if you're worried about this whole thing or, you know, God, this is... It's science, but it's not science. A good guess that stands up to observation is science the same way as a lucky guess that stands up to science is science. You don't have to always have 
something that works logically up front. If it works logically afterwards and it's counterintuitive, but people react to it, congratulations, you probably are going to be able to be more successful than the people next to you who are only using the one club of logic to solve all their problems. Make sense? We started somewhere middle of the road with talking about a Rolls Royce. So not everything that works makes sense and not everything that makes sense works. This is the grill from that $400,000 Rolls Royce. It looks beautiful. It looks perfect. However, ladies and gentlemen, it is an optical illusion. The grill is actually closer together at the top than it is in the middle, but your eye sees it as perfectly perpendicular. That's the way the world is. We are judging things based on our perception, not necessarily on the reality, and that's what we're trying to do. So if you're interested in the Digital 15, here are the books and sources that kind of were a part of this and the friends of mine have come into my classes. 